Hello YouTube, RJ. Hey, today we're going to cut through the BS. Have you ever had one of those days when things didn't go the way you expected? Well, this video is one of those days. Little did I know at this point that this video was going to be very different than I had planned. If you're like me, you've heard many times that the Franklin oscillator is really stable compared to other oscillators. But I, I've never seen anybody actually test this and quantitatively be able to show that. So as many of my viewers know, I'm in the process of building a voltage controlled oscillator and I was trying to decide what style of oscillator I was going to use. And so I decided I'd do a little testing. So today we're going to find out, is it really true? Is the Franklin really as stable as everyone says it is? Here's what I've got on the bench. So I'm going to use this G3 UUR oscillator that I've built in the past to sort through crystals, if you remember that. it's a, Of course, it's crystal stabilized by the crystal itself, so I'm going to use that as a baseline. Then I've got a Colpitz made uh, on a design out of the experimental methods of ra in radio frequency designs. It's numbers 4.34. I built it to have a coal pits that's well designed. I turn around and build a Franklin along the designs of like you've seen solder smoke and many of them putting out from the old uh, the old magazine articles. And we're gonna we're gonna have a shootout if you will. We're gonna put these things to the test. So the baseline G3 UUR crystal oscillator. We'll see how stable it is. So we've got a baseline to know what to expect from an oscillator that's very stable. And I did something different. This right here is going to be our tank circuit. I left the tank circuit off of the two oscillators. And what I'm going to do is use the exact same tank circuit on both of them. So there's no variations in the quality or the values of the capacitors or the toroid or anything. They're, they're using the exact same toroid, the exact same capacitors for their tank circuits. So what this will do is this will take that factor out and it will leave us with just the circuit design itself as the variable. Now you also notice that these are not variable frequency oscillators. The tank circuit is a fixed values. And the purpose for that is to remove any variations from a variable capacitor or vary actors out of the circuit. I want to get down to where all I'm doing is the only thing changing is the actual design of the oscillator. That's the only variable in it. Tank circuit's identical. There is no variable capacitors or vary actors in it, just the circuit itself. So I went ahead and ran the G3 UUR, and so I'm going to pop it up on the computer here a second, and let's take a look at how it did before we start testing these other ones. Okay, here we are. I've got a spreadsheet set up. Um, you can see I've got some worksheets for the Colpits and the Franklin with no data in them yet. But here's how the G3 UUR worked out. Uh, even being crystal controlled, there are still some variation. It's not too bad though. If we look here, when you first come on, it dropped in frequency about 10 hertz and then bounced up about 21 hertz and then somewhat stabilized out. Uh, it did this in about 12 minutes. So it took about 12 minutes to stabilize and that's a crystal controlled oscillator. We've, we've got our work cut out for us to make a really stable oscillator. It's a, this is probably one of the toughest things in analog uh, electronics. Here's our temperature here. You can see it didn't vary a whole lot. Down here we've got uh, we've got the stats for us. Temperature only varied 0.4 degrees C in the chamber in this two-hour run. We can see here that in the uh, overall, the drift maximum from the, the minimum frequency to the maximum frequency, we drift 23 hertz. That's not bad. That, that's really good, actually. If you give it an hour warm-up, which I know is a long time, but you know a lot of people that you'll read that's been working with these oscillators, they say they really don't stabilize for an hour. Pretty well, you, you've got to give them an hour to look at them for, for totally stabilized. And we're going to see if that's true. This one here was 12 minutes. We, we can see how well they did. But I'm, I've got a calculation here for one of our statistics that after the first hour or the next hour, we're going to monitor how much it drifts. And you can see this only drifted 2 hertz in the second hour. So after an hour warm-up, this thing became rock stable. In fact, you can see that the if it was to drift from that two hertz slowly over the hour, it would have been 0 0.033333 hertz per minute. You're talking rock on the money there. I mean, this thing is rock solid after it warms up. But even this has about 12 minutes where it, it kind of does its thing. But even that's not bad when you consider that the total variation was 23 hertz. That's that's pretty good. We're going to go back over the bench 
and get started on the test. Okay, so you can see that I went ahead and got the tank circuit. Um, I think I, maybe I didn't mention, I did go ahead and Q-dope this well to give us every chance we can here to doing well. So I went ahead and attached our tank circuit to our coal pits. I'm going to go ahead and get it into the chamber. Most of my viewers should remember the test chamber from quite a while ago I built for t just for this, for testing stuff thermally and stuff. I can heat this if I choose. I can control the temperature. Um, I can power things with it. I can uh, take multiple readings from my instruments. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and put this in the chamber. Go ahead and click, connect up the RF out port. And then I'll go ahead and hook up the power. And we'll get it fired up and we'll run this for two hours. And I won't, uh, and what I'll do is I'll do a time lapse. We'll do a screenshot time lapse of the program. We'll jump over there and let you see me set it up, get it started. I'll time lapse through so you can see in just a couple, you know, a few seconds the two hour run and actually see uh, how it's looking. And let's seal this rascal up. Okay, we're over on the computer. I'm going to open up the thermal test cell software I wrote to control the test cell. It's going to want a file name. We're going to call this uh, Coal Pits Experimental Methods and RF Design. Okay, how long are we going to want to run? We're going to do two hours, so we're talking 120 minutes. We're going to take samples every 20 seconds. I do not want to heat. I do want to measure the temperature. I do want to measure the frequency. I do want, want to normalize the frequency. I don't want to wait for the start. Don't measure. Don't measure LCR. Don't apply a fixed voltage. Don't apply a variable. Okay, let me go over and turn the power on the power supply, and I'll start the program. Give me just a second. And there we go. So we're going to take our first reading here in two seconds, and every 20 seconds after that. There we go. Alrighty, I'll let that roll. I'll kick it into high speed here, and you can watch this over in a few seconds. You can see what it looks like. Okay, at this point, I had to stop it. You might notice that about mid-screen down, we changed. We were doing about 5 megahertz, and all of a sudden, within a matter of a minute or so, we dropped to like 0.439 hertz. So I knew something was wrong, so I stopped and we went over to the bench to try to figure out what was going on with this oscillator. Well, we ran into a little problem there. Um, after about a, close to about a thousand seconds, about 16 minutes, the oscillator continued to drift down and then stopped running. My thought is that I've got it, the frequency set with the, the capacitors down at the bottom end of the frequency range with this inductor where it's going to oscillate. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull one of the capacitors off uh, that should bring the frequency range up. I'll set it up. We'll start again. We'll try it again. We'll see how it works out. So cross your fingers that this will take care of the problem. Well, it didn't help. Actually, it ran almost exactly the same. The frequency was higher. At exactly the same time, it did the exact same thing. At this point, I'm scratching my head a little. So I went back to the bench and started working on some ideas. Okay, so we're left with a mystery. Why is our coal pits oscillator quitting after 16 minutes of operation? I removed one of the capacitors off the tank circuit and increased its frequency, and that didn't change anything. But I think the big clue to all of this is that it, it quit exactly 16 minutes. It, it's actually around 1,000 seconds, about just over 16 minutes. It quit exactly at the same time, even if the frequency was different. So this gives me a little bit of an idea, a theory, if you will, of what's going on. But to explain my theory of what's happening, first we need to talk about oscillators. What are they? How they work? I don't know that I've ever spoke on this yet, so let me give you a very simplified. Later on, I'll do videos where I go into more details about the operation of oscillators and amplifiers and such, but right now let's do a little simple rundown. Okay, here's the circuit this thing is built on, and what I want to show is we can ignore this set stage of it 
this is a buffer. This just buffers the output to make sure our load doesn't pull down our oscillator. So you can kind of think of this from this point over as not being in the circuit for what we're concerned about. What happens is this is our output of our oscillator and it's going into this transistor to be buffered. So we're going to assume that this is the end of the road and right here is where our signal is coming out of our oscillator. So the oscillator is nothing but an amplifier. Uh, the old joke in analog electronics is, how do you build an oscillator? Try to build an amplifier. And the reason is, it's not hard to get an amplifier to oscillate. What it requires is a amplifier, which we're bringing in voltage here through this JFET to ground through a 2.2K resistor. And what we're doing is we have a tank circuit. It's kind of cluttered looking here, but we have our coal pits with our split capacitors here as part of our tank circuit. This inductor is the inductor. And then we have a few other things going on. Now, I do not have the variable capacitor in here. This is to adjust your VFO to be where you want it to be. And I do not have the variax in there. I have fixed capacitors in place of this. As I explained earlier, we wouldn't have the variables involved with these. What happens is you have the potential for current to flow through this JFET. And it will because the JFETs are on if you don't pull a negative voltage. So what happens is when you turn this on, voltage runs through and there's kind of a surge of energy that runs in and charges capacitors here. This causes an oscillation of its own. Your tank circuit starts cycling back and forth. The capacitors charge, then they want to discharge through the inductor. So they discharge through the inductor, then they run out of, of energy and the inductor has a field that falls in and creates energy and puts energy back in the capacitors. Once the capacitors are charged and the inductor is no longer got a field anymore, uh, the current wants to run back through the inductor again. So when this happens, the, the capacitors put out current in one direction. When the field falls back, the inductor sends the current back the opposite and charges the capacitors the other way around. And so this happens back and forth, but losing energy each time. If you ring a tank circuit, it will charge up and start start to oscillate at the frequency uh, depending on the capacitance and the inductance the old 2 pi uh, square root of lc to get your frequency it'll oscillate at that frequency but for a very brief time it'll just run a, run out of energy so what we need is an amplifier that can take that oscillating signal and feed into an amplifier and then we need that signal to come back out in phase and be fed back to the base. That's what this part right here is all about. We're bringing our output and we're feeding it back into our amplifier. And it works just like taking a microphone on a PA system and putting it near one of the speakers. You know that squeal you'll get. It's because you're going around amplifying, going around amplifying, and you're doing the same thing with audio. And that's the squeal. Now the difference is we have a tank circuit set up on this one so that it squeals, if you will, at the a fixed frequency we've determined with that LC tank. So this is what an oscillator is. We're basically going around in a big loop here. And there is something called the Barkhausen criteria you have to meet to have an oscillator. And that is your amplifier must provide at least one or greater gain, a gain of one or slightly greater than one. And that's kind of a lie in my opinion, because one won't do it. And the reason is you have losses in the capacitance and ductance and everything in the circuit itself, you have losses. So if you had a gain of one, you would be losing out by the amount of the losses in the tank circuit each time. You need to be a little higher than one. If you were one or less, what's gonna happen is you're going to start this ringing from the surge of current of turning it on and it's gonna ring but each time, if the amplifier is not kicking it back with enough energy, this thing is going to go down very little and it'll bleed over time and it eventually will run out of energy. I think that's what we've got going on. I think this circuit probably does not have enough gain. Why? When there's, these circuits are you know, well vetted, maybe variations of the parts and you know how that goes. So anyway, I think what's happening is we're not getting enough gain in this circuit and so what's happening is that's why it's always 16.6 minutes or whatever. That's how long it takes for this circuit to bleed at the gain that it has. So my guess is increasing the gain would solve the problem. I want to get some testing on this and verify my theory before I start messing around. So what I want to do is I'm going to hook this thing up to the oscilloscope, set up the camera where you can see it. We're going to run it. We're going to see what we see. 
I've had this on the oscilloscope when I first built it, and it had a nice looking sign, but I didn't run it for 16 minutes. I didn't look for this problem. I ran it for, you know, a minute at a time. Looks good. Everything's great. We're ready to go. You know, one or two minutes of me looking at it probably wasn't enough to see that. So, and I wasn't looking for it either. So let me set up real quick. Let's get the oscilloscope going. And let's take a look and see if we can see that and if that's what's going on we'll we'll try increasing the gain and we can do that very easily this uh, resistor right here this 2.2k resistor it controls the gain of the amplifier so changing that we would need to lower this to increase the gain so we would want to lower this some and see what happens let me get set up let's take a look on the oscilloscope here we go i'm set up looking at the oscilloscope i'm going to put my phone over here so we've got something we can see how long we've been going and so power coming on and starting the stopwatch okay hope you saw that it does look like that's what's happening apparently after about 16 minutes the signal amplitude gets low enough my frequency counter cannot pick it up correctly then we're done for so, and the signal keeps bleeding down. Even after I stop that clip, it, it goes on down and down. So my only thought is, as I speculated, the gain of the amplifier is just not quite enough. That might not be what it is. We've got to figure out if that's correct or not. So I'm going to leave everything set up just the exact same way it is. I'm just going to take a moment off camera and pull this 2.2K resistor. I'm going to drop a 1.5K in there. That should give us plenty of gain, I would believe, to make up the difference. And we'll start all over again. I'll just, I'll come back. We'll do the same thing again, and we'll see if it bleeds down over time. If it does, we've got something else going on. It's time to start looking somewhere else. Okay, here we go. We've put in the 1.5K resistor, and I'm power on. Start the watch. Well, as you can see, it's still bleeding down even with the change. Um, we just have more gain. It started at a higher voltage and it's taking longer to bleed down, but it, it is bleeding out on me. I'm not sure what's going on here. Um, components are good. They're, they're new J310s uh, bought from Mauser. Test excellent on the, the tester. Everything tests good. I've went over the circuit. It's, uh, it's built for the specs of the schematic in the book with the ex the only difference is I don't have the two variacs. I have fixed capacitors in their place. Uh, this is kind of a head scratcher. So one thing I want to try while it's still bleeding down on me over here and we can see, I pull out my little air blower. I'm going to blow a little air and see if there's any thermal issues going on. Just, just trying to troubleshoot here. So let me see what I can come up with. Let's see if anything happens. With a little bit of air. I don't think that's doing it for me. Just wanted to give it a try. Nothing seems to be getting warm. It's thermal, shutting off, start, turning it back on quickly should not bring me back up to full voltage. I guess I could try that real quick. Let me do a quick power cycle and see what happens. Now I'm back to full voltage. Hmm. This is a head scratcher. I'm not sure what I'm dealing with here. I have checked voltages, by the way. Uh, I'm getting my consistent voltage from my voltage regulator. I'm going to have to knock off at this point. This is going to have to be a multi-part video and work on figuring out what's going on here. If you guys got some good ideas, put them in the comments. Hopefully we'll figure this out and we'll be able to get back on testing and comparing these oscillator circuits. Thanks for tuning in. Hope, uh, hope I entertained you a little bit. Hope to see you in the next video.